Okay, so um, in question, uh, question number seven, it says uh, we're going to use a problem solving model. So baby, uh, basically, this is just an application problem. Okay, so here's the situation. You got some guy that's standing on a bridge right here. And apparently, he's going to drop an orange, and this orange is going to fall off the bridge. And when things fall or drop, they typically follow an exponential model, or a, not an exponential model, but a parabolic curve. And so what's going to happen right there is the height that he drops that orange from, it said in the problem, was 40 feet. And that orange is going to drop, drop, drop until it hits the water, and we're going to imagine that this x-axis there is the water and this y-axis is the height and so when that height is zero that's whenever it's going to hit the water make sense now this x-axis is really kind of representing the height that's when the height is zero yes but it's also representing your time in seconds that it's dropping so this is the seconds that it's dropping. And in the problem, it used the letter T for time in seconds. And the height, which is my y-axis, they used the letter H, which is representing my height. And this is represented in feet. And so if it's dropped at 40 feet and goes to 0 to 40, I need to come up with a scale to count by. So the scale that we're going to count by is just going to be 10. So that's going to be like 10. 20, 30, 40, and so forth. Okay, so there's my scale. So I kind of made a graph, and it's not a perfect graph, but it's good enough to get an idea of what's going on in the picture. So what is the equation that models this height? This height is modeled by this equation, negative 16t squared plus 40. And so we can make a table of values for my x's and my y's, but remember, your x's are your input values, which is really my t's. And the height is really my y's, that's h. So what we're going to look at is if the time is zero seconds, how high is the orange? So what that means is before you let it go, what's the initial? The zero stands for the initial or the starting height before you dropped it. Well, in the problem it said he dropped it from a height of 40 feet. So that initial height right there when time is zero, when your time is zero, it starts at how high? 40 feet. Do you all follow that? And then what happens is, after one second, two seconds, three seconds, you know, it's going to drop, right? It's just like dropping something off of this desk or throwing it in the air. Whenever I throw it, it takes time before it hits the ground. And what's the time before it hits the ground? So that's what we need to calculate. I know what the time is after zero seconds, but what's the time after one second? Maybe after two seconds and so forth, right? So let's figure out what would the time be after one second. We'll plug that one into your equation. So this would be negative 16 times what? 1 squared plus 40. And negative 16 times 1 squared is just negative 16 plus 40, which would give me what? What's negative 16 plus 40? 24 feet. So after one second, that thing has been dropping for one second, it would be about right there, which is around 24 feet. That's not perfect, but it's close enough. So this thing dropped like this, and it goes here. And then what about after two seconds? What would the height be? We'll plug in a 2. <clears throat> so that would be negative 16 times 2 squared plus 40. And so negative, or uh, 2 squared would just be a 4. So 2 times 2 is 4. So it's really a negative 16 times 4, which is a negative what? 64 plus 40. And if you add negative 64 plus 40, what do I get? Negative 24, isn't it? So after two seconds, it's negative 10, 20, 30. So it's negative 24 down here somewhere, right? So somewhere there. So this thing's going like this somehow. So it's that U-shaped curve doing something like that. No, it's not very pretty, but you get the idea. Okay, now let me ask you this question. When did it hit the water? Right? Because this equation models the height in the air, but once it hits here and goes down, this is no longer the height in the air. This is the height in the what? In the water. 
That's not the same equation, is it? If I drop something right now from, from uh, six feet, it's going to hit the floor a lot faster than if I dropped it on top of a water at six feet. Why? Because there's displacement. Things don't drop as fast in water as they do in the air, do they? Right? There's less friction and everything else in the air. So this part of the graph doesn't make sense as it relates to the problem. Because I just want to know what is the height in the air. Okay? And then I want to figure out when did it hit the water. So I know that after two seconds it's at negative 24 feet below the water if there if it was uh, not water, but I need to figure out when did it hit the water. So right here I've got to figure out when is the height equal to zero. So in this problem it's a little bit different because what I have to do is I have to figure out when the height is zero. What would x be or what would t be if the height is zero? How would I solve that with pencil and paper? You just plug in what you know. What do I know? I know my height is zero, so plug that in for h. And then I get zero is equal to negative 16t squared plus 40 and figure out what's the time to give you a height of zero. So you got to do this one pencil and paper. This is just like day one with me. Remember day one? Solving equations? How do you solve that equation? Right? What's your steps for solving equations? Distribute? Nothing to distribute. Combine like terms on the left side and the right side? No like terms. Right? Because remember how I said that those steps never go away? Next step, get your variables on one side, constants on the other. I've already got a variable here, so let's just pick this one up and move it over here. Or subtract 40 to make that 40 disappear on the right side, right? Remember that? Use opposite operations. So now on the left side, I'm left with negative 40 is equal to negative 16t squared. Now what do I do? Isolate the variable. Right? That's my last step. Isolate the variable. So i got to get the variable by itself by getting rid of that negative 16. And how is it attached to the t squared? By multiplication, so I divide by negative 16. Negative 16 divided by negative 16 is 1. 1 times t squared is what? t squared. So what's a negative 40 divided by a negative 16? It would be a positive 2 point what? Somebody tell me. Plug it in your calculator. You're going to need it real quick because I'm going to show you something in your calculator here in a second. 2.5? Is that right? Now the t squared is not by itself. Okay? So what do I do to get rid of the little squared? I still don't have my variable isolate. I do the opposite of squaring something from chapter 5, which is to take the square root. Y'all remember that? To undo a square, we take the square root. So t would be equal to... What is the square root of 2.5? Y'all cut on your calculator. And then let's figure out what is the square root, bless you, of 2.5. Hit enter. What do I get that to be? 1.58113883008. So let's just round it to be about two decimal places. So that would be 1.5 what? 8. So what do we just find out? What do we find out in this problem? The time to hit the water is 1.58 seconds. Now is that all that the problem asked in that? No. It says in how many seconds will the orange hit the water? We figured that one out. That's 1.58. And then we have to use inequalities to uh, come up with a reasonable domain and range. Okay. So after we figure out how long it takes to uh, hit the water, we have to figure out what is the domain of this function and then what is the range of this function. Now, before I get to domain and range, I want to show you something. Y'all ready? I want to show you how to figure out when this hit the water by using this. Okay. So what is this that we really found out? We found out this point on the graph. And this point on the graph was about 1.580, wasn't it? In 1.58 seconds, see that's my x-axis, x always comes first, and then the y-coordinate comes next. So that point on a graph would be at the coordinates 1.580. Everybody understand? Yes? Can this do that? 
I'm going to show you. We can graph this in our calculator. We can take the function rule for a falling orange and graph it by going to your home screen. Go to New Document. Don't save your last one. And then we're going to add a graph. We want to add this graph, this h, but there's not an h here. This is either f of x or y. Since this is in function notation, this is my first function. So f1 of x is h equals negative 16. Now, I don't have a t, right? I can't graph on a t axis. This only has an x and a y axis. There's my y, my x, so my t becomes my input value, which is my domain, is represented with an x. Inputs are x's. Domain values are x's. And then I'd square that and then add 40 to it. And there's a picture of the falling orange, except it doesn't look like ours. This picture has a left half and a right half, and it doesn't show the top. Now let me ask you a question. Does it make sense to have the left half of this graph if a person's right here on the bridge and he drops it from right there? That's not a reasonable domain. So we want to graph this using a reasonable domain. Okay? So let's get a better picture, in other words, on our graph. So let's change our window so we can see it as it makes a little bit more sense. So let's go to Menu. Go to Window. Let's go to Window Settings, which is 1. And let's start off our axes. Let's just start off a little bit to the left. Actually, let's just start off at zero. Let's see what it looks like. And then how many seconds did it take to hit the water? Less than two, right? So what's a good X max? The maximum we used on our graph was three, so we can just go to three. And then let's just go to tab. And this right here, whenever we go to tab, it's saying, what do you want to count by? Let's just count by ones. And then go to tab, and then my Y minimum. See, I went to negative 24 here, but then we said that didn't make sense as it related to the problem. So let's just go to a Y minimum of zero, and then a Y maximum of what? Where was it dropped from? 40. So let's just go a little bit above 40. Let's go to 45. And let's count by fives, let's say. Well, well let's count by tens since our graph was count by tens. That's our scale. It means what are you counting by? Go to tab and then go to OK. And there's a little bit better picture, kind of like ours, right? Do we follow that? So that's a picture of a semi-reasonable domain from what we got a picture of here. So a while ago I said, hey, we can figure out where this actually crossed the x-axis. But the problem here is I can't see that really good. So let me show you how to find that point right there where a value crosses the x-axis in your calculator is called a zero. So I want you to hit menu real quick and let's zoom out so I can see the x-axis. Just one click. So go to window or menu and then go to window which is four. So click four, hit enter and then zoom out one. So let's zoom out down here a little bit. So move your little cursor where do you want to zoom out. See how I see that axis now? How do I ask my calculator to find out where this hit the water or where it crosses the x-axis like this one did? See, we had to actually calculate 1.58, but your calculator would do that for you. Here's how it does it. You ready? And you need to do this because this will give you a lot of questions right on the EOC because we have to solve quadratics later on. And sometimes the solutions are called zeros, but a zero is nothing more than an x-intercept. Where does it cross the x-axis? Right? So hit menu. Go over here where it says analyze graph, which is 6. And we want to find the x-intercept. You notice it doesn't say x-intercept here. An x-intercept is where y is 0. Where y is 0. Where y is 0 is where a graph crosses the x-axis, so we're going to find a 0. See this little line? It says, what do you want to find it in between? So I need to move this line to the left of where I want to find the 0. I'm moving it to the left of where I think it is and hit enter. And then move it somewhere to the right of where you think it is, hit enter. What did you get back as an answer? 1.581138. Isn't that the same as what we got here? So your calculator actually helps you solve quadratics. We just solved a quadratic equation using the calculator. 
And that solution is called a what in this? An x-intercept or a zero. I just showed you how to solve that kind of cheat on the EOC. If you had to solve this equation right here to find the zero, if you just graph it, find out where it crosses the x-axis. And where it crosses the x-axis is zero. It's where y is zero. That's why it's called a zero of the function. So there's a couple different ways of finding 1.58, right? Now, what's the domain of this problem? Well, the domain is the time. How long, in other words, was the orange falling? The orange started off, or your x values on the graph, if you want to use t for time, that's fine too, started off at what? A time of zero because I haven't let it start falling yet. And that's what this is representing, the height after you dropped it. So it starts off at a time of zero, which means that's where I'm holding it. As soon as I let go, it starts counting, tick, 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 until it actually hits here. And once it hits there, that's when the time stops. Okay? So this as an x-axis, it's traveling on my x's in between my fingers from zero to where? Where is that point right there? 1.58. So my x or my domains or the x values on this graph, that's what this is asking. What's the domain? What x's make sense in this graph? The x's are in between, which means greater than or equal to zero, and then less than or equal to 1.58. Can y'all tell me the range? The range just means what's the highest and lowest height of this orange? What's the highest the orange ever was? What's the lowest it ever gets? Zero. A height of zero is when it hits the water. So how do I describe that? The height, which is y, would be bigger than or equal to, which means it's got to be bigger than or equal to the smallest value, which is zero, but it's got to be less than or equal to the height which you dropped it at, which is 40. These are your reasonable domains and ranges. You have to be able to describe reasonable domains and ranges on graphs. We did this in chapter 2. That's a repeat. Y'all remember doing that? Chapter 9 is, or uh, problem number 9 on your homework from last night is almost like 7. So we'll do 9 a little quicker. All right, let's look at 9. A bird drops a stick to the ground from a height of 80 feet. The function, h is equal to negative 16t squared plus 80, gives the stick's approximate height above the ground and feet after so many seconds of falling. Let's graph that function. So let's draw, draw a picture of it right, right quick. Okay? There's my x and my y axis. What do you think my y axis is referring to? What's the y axis referring to? The output values. Isn't that the height? That this bird's flying? And so this bird's flying here, and it's got a stick in its mouth, and then it drops the stick. What's going to happen? It's going to drop, 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 drop until it hits a height of zero. And the bird dropped it at a height of 80, and it's going to drop until the height of zero, which means that's where it's crossing the x-axis, which is the x-intercept. Okay, so that's what we're going to figure out. How long did it take to hit the ground if the function rule for this is negative 16t squared plus 80? What's the 80? That's the y-intercept, remember? That's where it was dropped from. So when time is 0, what was the height? 80. When time is 1 second, 2 seconds, 3 seconds, 4 seconds, 5 seconds, how long does it take to hit the ground? So we come up with a table of values for that if you want. We can say, all right, when time is 0, that's the initial time that the bird let it go, the stick was at... 80 feet, so I have a point right there on the graph. What about after one second, what would the height be? Guys, watch this. You want to know this table? Instead of me having to plug in a one here and going right here like this, watch. I don't have to go over here and go, all right, it's negative 16 times one squared plus 80. And then say, hey, that's 64 feet. Then after two seconds, instead of going negative 16 times 2 seconds squared, right, because I'm plugging into 2 there, plus 80. And saying, all right, after 2 seconds, it's at a height of 16 feet. And then going over here and plotting 1, I'm at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. 
So instead of going, I'm at one second, I'm at 64. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 64 is about right here. And then after two seconds, I'm at 16. There's 10, 20, so 16 would be about maybe right in there. Instead of doing that, right, I could come up with these points a lot quicker by going to your home screen, new document, don't save your last one, add the graph. Let's graph a picture of it in our calculator, right? What's the picture of my calculator? The height is equal to negative 16t. I don't have a t, so I've got to use an x right here at the bottom. There's my x squared plus 80. All right, and then hit enter. There's a picture of it. Well, I don't like the picture of it. Maybe I can use a table. Like, I don't have to calculate these. Watch. I don't have to calculate these things. Just hit Control T. Control T. Like Todd. There it is. There's a table. If my height is zero, I'm at 80. See how I had that point? If my height is one, I'm at 64. If my height's at two, I'm at 16. What if my height's at three? Or if it's been dropping for three seconds, I said height. So if my time is zero seconds, one seconds, two seconds, three seconds, where am I at? I'm at a height of negative 64. You see that? So I could continue to graph this in order to get a curve, but I've got a picture of that up here. Let's make a picture that makes a little bit more sense. So let's make it a little bit prettier, in other words. Let's go to Menu, or let's take the table off first. Hit Control t to take it off. Control t cuts it on. Control t takes it off. And then let's change our window here. Let's go to Menu and change our window like ours. So go to Window Zoom, which is 4. Go to Window Settings, which is 1. Let's go our X max at negative 1 so we can see our X axis and stuff. And then I don't need to go all the way up to 5 seconds. I probably could go to 3 seconds because I know it's going to cross in between there somewhere, right? It's going to go like that and cross down. So it's somewhere between 2 and 3, so I could just go to 3. Let's let it automatically come up with its own scale. If you want to do a scale of one, you can or whatever you want. But sometimes you can just leave it at auto and it'll be fine. All right, and then my Y minimum. Let's go a little bit below this. Let's go to like a negative five here on our picture so we can see that X axis. Negative five, that's the lowest your Y is going to be. Let's go to a Y max. Well, that's 80. Let's just go a little bit above 80. So let's just say a 90, let's say. Let's count by tens like on ours. And go to tab and go to OK. And there's a picture. So we get a little bit of the left half and the right half. But the left half doesn't make sense. Why does the left half not make sense? Because the bird didn't drop it here and throw it up in the air. It didn't say it dropped it way back here and then threw it up in there. And then it got to this point and fell. This is where the bird dropped it. So that's really all that makes sense. So what's the question? When does it hit the x-axis? When does it hit the x-axis? That's the same thing when the height is zero. So if I'm the zero of this function without having to plug in a zero here and calculating it with pencil and paper, which you could. You'd have to subtract 80, subtract 80, divide by 16. So it would be negative 16t squared is equal to a negative 80, divide by negative 16. We could do all this math, or I could just find the zero of this function by going to Menu, Analyze Graph, find the what? What am I looking for? The x-intercept. What's the x-intercept? Another word for that. It's where y is zero. Move that to the left of where you think it is, to the right of where you think it is, and find that point. Where is that point? When X is about 2.236, Y is zero. You see that? Y is zero. And I just rounded it to three decimal places that time. If I were to solve this with pencil and paper, you know what? I'd get the same thing. Watch. We'll finish solving this. It's kind of messy, but I'll finish solving it. So... Let's go over here to our little scratch pad calculator and let's take that negative 80 and divide by negative 16. So we'll finish up the pencil and paper one, see if we get the same thing. And I get 5 is equal to t squared. And then to solve it, take the square root. So what's the square root of 5? Once again, I can just raise that to the point 0.5 powers, the same thing as the square root. And see how I get t over here to be 2.236, the same thing I got here. So if you did it with pencil and paper, you're going to get the same answer regardless. So 
We've got the answer. What's the answer to the question? When's the stick going to hit the ground? The stick hits the ground when? In 2.236 seconds. The domain in this problem is what and what's the reasonable range in this problem? The domain is how long the stick was flying down in the air until it hits it. So it went from zero to what? So let's just use T for time. Your time went from zero to what? What's the maximum the time was in the air? 2.36. Does everybody understand that? That's a, you can get a blue ribbon on that tonight if you want. Because we've got one on domains and ranges of quadratic functions. So if you understand these two problems, you could get a blue ribbon really fast. And you need 23 to six weeks. What's the range? The range is the highest and the lowest the stick actually was. What's the highest the stick was? What's the lowest the stick was? That's just your Y's. Your highest and your lowest Y's on the graph. So the height of the stick was in between what? Zero. That's when it hits the ground. It's the lowest it ever was. The highest it ever was was when the bird initially dropped it at 80 feet. And that's what you have to have as answers, and that's how you use the application of these things. Things dropping, things being thrown are quadratic models. When you throw things up in the air, they typically go up, and they typically go back down. When you drop things off the bridge or drop them out of the air, they're typically going to follow a, quad, or, um, a um, quadratic function following down. Does that make sense? Okay, we need to finish up our notes from yesterday, so hang on to that. We'll finish this and bring up any more questions tomorrow. So that's actually going to be due tomorrow. What we're going to do is uh, pick up in our notes where we left off. And we left off in our notes on problem number three. Did we put these in order from narrowest to widest? Narrowest to widest. What was that again? Y'all help me out so we can move on. See... The absolute value of that is 4. The absolute value of that is 1 fourth. The absolute value of that is 1. So the bigger the absolute value of the A term, the more narrow it is. So the most narrow one would be a negative 4x squared. Then what's next? x squared. And then what was the last one? Now let's prove it in our calculator. Can you graph all three of those on the same page? We're going to prove it real quick just to kind of make sure that I'm not lying to you. So the most narrow is to the widest. <clears throat> so let's look at that. Cut on your calculator. Go to your home screen. Do a new graph. You already did that? Don't save your last one. And then let's add a graph. This is going to be our first one. This is going to be our second one. This is going to be our third one. So add a graph, which is two. So how do I plug in my first one? It doesn't say y, it's what? f of x. It's the f1 of x, which means it's my first function rule. That's negative 4x squared. Hit enter. Pretty narrow, isn't it? So let's see if this one is wider than that one. So I've got to graph that one on top of that, or put it on the same coordinate plane. So how do I put it on the same coordinate plane? I hit tab. And then graph y is equal to x squared. You guys, right? You ought to be doing this. I know this stuff. I know you guys don't. That's why I'm doing this. Follow along. See how it's wider? And then what's this one fourth? It better be outside of that. Because as this gets closer to zero, it becomes more linear. So let's graph one more. So to graph another one on top of that, hit tab. And notice how it takes me to the third function. The third function now is one-fourth, so hit one divided by four. And then your x, you're using this down here as x, and then you're just squaring it. See how it's wider? So you're right. Okay, so we can prove that by actually putting it in our calculator if we need to do that in our homework, which is question 15 in your homework last night and 16. So you can verify your answers to 15 and 16 this way. So what's the order from the widest to the most narrow? Well, once again, just put it in the opposite order. You're going to have to do that in your homework, too. So the widest was the 1 fourth x squared, obviously, because it's a lot wider here than the parent function, which is 
y is equal to x squared. And then we have the most narrow, which was the one pointing down, which is y is equal to a negative one-fourth x squared. Got that? So that's part two. Now, what can you say about the A term in relationship to graphs opening? If your A term is bigger than a 1, that would be like um, Y is equal to a 2X squared or Y is equal to a 3X squared or Y is equal to a negative 2, right, X squared, like that. Or Y is equal to a negative 5X squared. When that absolute value... See, the absolute value of that is 5, and the absolute value of that is 2. When that absolute value is bigger than 1, the opening is more what than the parent function? It's going to be more narrow, which means it's stretched vertically. And if your A value, the absolute value of that A value, is in between 0 and 1, so an example of that would be something like 1 fourth x squared, or y is equal to a negative 1 eighth x squared. Because if I take the absolute value of that, that's one-fourth, which is obviously between zero and one. Absolute value of that is one-eighth, which is obviously between zero and one. Then the opening is, how is the opening compared to the parent function? Wider. And that's where we stopped yesterday. So what about this one? What if your A value is a negative, like in this one? Or your A value is a negative, like in this one or this one? What does that do to the graph? Well, just like in this one that we looked at a while ago, that one's a negative. What does it do to the graph? Right? It flips it. It's called it's being flipped. That's not how we say that mathematically, though. See, how we say that mathematically is that it's a reflection across the x-axis. See, it's no longer going up like these. If it's a negative, it's being flipped down like that. So you can't say it points, it's no longer pointing up, it's pointing down. You can't say that. You can't say it's flipped. You can't say that. You have to say it is a reflection across the x-axis. So if your A is negative, the graph is reflected. You better know that. So another word for reflected is flipped, but you'll never see that on a test. Okay, you'll see the word is reflected across the x-axis. Don't say it's pointing up or pointing down. You say it's reflected across the x-axis, which means that it's no longer pointing up. It's pointing down. All right, so show me you can do this. Put these in order from the widest to the most narrow. Which one's the widest? Fx equals one-third x squared. So the first one would be f of x is equal to a negative one-third x squared. Why? Because the absolute value of that is between zero and one. And the closer that is to zero, the flatter it is. So I agree, that's the widest. And what would come next? F of x is equal to what? Negative x squared. And then finally, the most narrow would be? Any questions about that? Do we need to plug it in the calculator to check it, or do you, can you see that? Because the absolute value of this is one-third, the absolute value of this is one, the absolute value of this is three. That's small, so it's wide, right? And that's a little bit smaller than this one, so it's more narrow, but this is the more narrow because it starts like one-third is here, one is here, and three is there. Okay, let's go to this last page. We're only going to get through problem four, and we're going to stop. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to use your calculator to fill out this table here and then tell me how this graph is different than this graph once we have a picture. So let's fill out the table. How do I come up with a table of values for this? I could actually plug in a 2 and do it by hand and take 2 times 2 squared, which is 4. 2 times 4 is 8. Right? I can plug in a 0 and get, hey, that's a 0. I can plug in a 2. 2 times 2 squared is 2 times 4, which is 8 again. Or you could get that table simply by going to your calculator because some functions are going to be difficult. Go to a new document, add your graph, and plug that rule in, 2x squared, and then hit enter. I've done two things. I've seen the picture of the graph. I already have it graphed, and there's a table there. Where's my table? Hit Control-T. And look, go over here to the left, 
And when x is negative 2, scroll up, I'm at 8, just like I have there. If x is 0, I'm at 0. If x is 2, I'm at 8. Everybody got that? All right, and there's a picture of the graph, too, because it automatically graphs it for you right there. So go to Control-T to take that table off, and let's plot those points. There's a point at 0, 0, negative 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It's right there. And then a positive 2, 7, 8 is right there. And then you connect those dots with a smooth curve. And it'd be a U-shaped curve called a what? Parabola. Right? So let's do the same thing here. Watch this. So go to tab. Let's do this function, which is 2x squared plus 3. Oh, tab. Let me go back up. I forgot to hit plus 3. Plus 3. You're right? Okay. There we go. It looks like it's the same graph, just moved up three units, isn't it? Well, let's see what our table says these are. If x is negative 2, what's y? We'll hit control T. Watch this. See this blue one? This is the output values for your fir first function rule, which was this one. How do I get to the second function rule? Tab over to the right. Just hit this button to the right. There it is. There's the x and the y's for this 2x squared plus 3. 2 times x squared plus 3. What's the y value there if x is negative 2? So let's go over here and go up to negative 2 and then go over. It's 11. 11. What if x is 0? If x is 0, I'm at what? 3. If x is 2, I'm at 11. What do you notice about this value from here to here? The y values from here to here. The y values from here to here. Aren't they just three more than that? 8 plus 3 is 11. 0 plus 3 is 3. 8 plus 3 is 11. Isn't it? So what does that mean? That's what this question's asking you. How is this graph different from this graph? Well, they're the same graphs. It's the same opening. Except these points are shifted up one, two, three units to be at zero, zero to zero, three. This point right here, which was at negative two, eight, has been shifted up to not negative two, eight, but negative two, eleven. So it's up one, two, three. This point also, which was at 2, 8, 2, 8, is shifted up 3 to 2, 11. So just go up 1, 2, 3, and it's there. So what's this graph look like? It looks just like the other graph, except it's just shifted up 3 units. So the graph of 2x squared plus 3 is the exact same graph of y is equal to 2x squared shifted what? Up 3 units. Now... A better word for shifted is this word, translated. Translated means it has been moved up, down, left, or right. Translation is the same thing as shifted, except it's a math term. I don't know why I put shifted in the notes. It's better to say translated. I wouldn't say moved. I say translated, up three units. So what about this one? What would you predict this one's going to do? Y is equal to x squared. You have the same x squared except there's a minus 3 at the end of it. Anybody have a prediction? The graph of y is equal to x squared minus 3 is the exact same opening as the graph y is equal to x squared except it is translated which way? This time if it's a minus 3, it's the opposite of a plus 3. It's not being shifted up. Minuses are being translated or shifted down three units. And we can prove that by looking at the graph of it real quick. So we're going to graph it real quick. We're going to graph the first one, which is y is equal to x squared. So we're going to go to a new document. Add the graph. So graph y is equal to x squared. And then hit tab and let's graph the other one, which is x squared minus 3, just to look at it. So it's x squared minus 3. Isn't it the same opening? Except every point shifted down three, down three, down three. So we're learning translations of functions. Transformations really is what we're learning. So can you tell me this based upon the other problems? 
If you have the graph 1 half x squared and y is equal to 1 half x squared plus 6, how are they related? Can you tell me in your words? They're the same what? Graphs, except one of them is <coughs> six units higher than the other one. So how do we say that in math terms? Well, it should be the graph of y equals or um, y equals one half x squared plus six is the graph of y is equal to one half x squared. Not shifted, but what's a better word for that? Translated. Translated which way? Up. Up six units. Do we understand that? What if that was a minus right there? It would be what? Translated. That was a minus, it would say down six units. Now let me ask you this one last question. What if I had y is equal to, and I'm just making one up, negative 2x squared, and y is equal to a negative 2x squared plus 6. Tell me how this graph is different than this one. It's what? They're the same graphs, right? Except one of them is six units above this one, right? Can you say that? Now watch this. Can you still say that if I do this? So like a while ago, that was six units up. Can you just say, okay, hey, these are the same graphs, but this one has a plus six at the end of it, so it shifted up six units. No, not if there's a B term. If there's a B term, it's not only shifted up, but it's also moved left and right. Remember, those are vertical pushes. So you can't use that unless I cover this up. Now you can say what? If that's not there, these are the same graphs, except this one shifted six units higher than this one, right? But if I put this here, what does that tell you? What's the only thing that tells you? Very good. You did learn from yesterday. That tells us our y-intercept. That just tells you the y-intercept from yesterday. Okay, but there's also a shift to the left somehow in this one. Do you all follow that? Okay. So just be careful that you can't just say these are... Now, uh, you can say the openings are exactly the same, aren't they? They both are pointing down, right, or reflections across the x-axis with the same wideness of the opening because they're both negative twos. Okay? So hopefully you do understand that. So uh, what I want you to do for homework is just finish up what we did last night. No new stuff.